What's up? You're listening to Playmakers Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Blackman. And on every episode, I interview a game industry legend or luminary to bring information to you that's going to help you do better on your project, in your discipline, in your domain, and to get a bigger, wider view of the game industry. This week, I've got Dave Roll, known as the Mobile Game Doctor. He has a lot to share about designing efficiently and effectively on mobile. That's coming up. Here we go. Dave Roll has held senior level positions, and I'm talking about executive positions at companies like Playdom, PopCap, Zynga, Pogo. You know, there aren't that many companies like that. Those are the biggest players in that space, and Dave's been there. If you play plants versus zombies, as you will learn in this interview, Dave is Crazy Dave, or at least the inspiration for Crazy Dave in those games. And we get into some really interesting information about what Dave has learned in his many, many years doing casual about designing efficiently and producing efficiently, minimizing design risk, finding the fun early, soft launch process, all that stuff, we get into it. So if you are working on a mobile project, on a casual project, or just want to get some best practices from that field, you're gonna get that in this episode. Dave is someone that I wanted to have on the show because he is someone that I personally admire as a designer and who I have gone to in the past with specific design issues that I'm working out when I've wanted some outside input and He's been very helpful to me in that capacity. So I have a lot of respect and trust in Dave, in his skills, in his background, and also in his attitude and professionalism. And I think you will get a taste of all that in this interview. Now, before we get to the interview, I just want to mention that if you are enjoying the the show, if you're getting something useful out of it, please do share with anyone you know who would enjoy it, who would enjoy this episode or any of the other episodes that we've done. You can also head to iTunes and subscribe and write us a review, which is awesome because that's how I find out who you want on the show, what's helping you, what you like about the show, and it also helps support the show and get the word out there. And if you just want to reach out to me directly, you can do that, jordan at brightblack.co. I want to hear about the struggles that you're having in your project, the topics that you want covered on the show, and the guests that you want on the show because this show is here to help you. It's for you. This is my way of serving the game design, production, and development community and the business community as well. So I will leave it at that and let's go talk to Dave Roll, the mobile game doctor. Well, thanks, Dave. Welcome to Playmakers. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, Jordan. It's a pleasure. I've had the chance to work with you on a couple of things, and I really admired your skills and your coolness and your honesty. I want to start with just getting into how you got into the industry. I know you've you've been in games for over 20 years. What brought you in and, and what got you interested? So I actually got into games, I guess, relatively late. Uh, so it was right around the time I was 30, which means I had a couple of careers before that. Um, you know, after college, spent about five years working in nonprofits, uh, saving the world. Oh, um, really? As, as you can see, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of nonprofits were you were you into? Uh, I did some environmental work. I did some diversity work, and I did some anti nuclear work. Sort of, you know, off at the the Bernie Sanders end of the political spectrum. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, it was really fun work, but I had a very interesting experience in a couple of different nonprofits where I had an opportunity to really kind of rise up in the ranks and take on a lot of responsibility in a very senior post. And I just couldn't get excited about it. And so the second time that this happened, I sort of took a giant step back and said, uh, OK, if I can't get excited about growing my career here, it's probably not the right career. And that actually led me to take stock of what do I love? What am I passionate about? And I've been actually kind of obsessed with games since I was very, very little. Like, I've been obsessed with games since literally before there were video games. Hmm. I was the little kid who wanted to have their parents play one more game of gin rummy before bedtime. 
<laughs> right? Um, and, you know, got together with my friends for games. Not for, too many kids like that anymore. Well, this is true because we've we've opened up, you know, kind of solo entertainment so much, right? The the rate at which entertainment pours into our lives at the moment is is staggering, right? Just the amount of content that's out there to interact with. Totally. Um, the idea at all that social gaming would be a distinct thing rather than just, you mean like what games are, shows how, how much we've done that. Yeah, I got into a couple of arguments with some semanticists at, uh, at GDC Talks about people talking about how games had forever been, you know, multiplayer and it was only in the last couple of decades they'd been single player and I'm, I pulled them aside and I said, actually, dude, you know, single player video games evolved from puzzles, not from games, right? But that's that's kind of semantic and nitpicky. Um, but I always loved games and I always loved technology. Um, and I also took a look around in, you know, this was the late 80s, early 90s and said, you know, do I think I can make a living making board games? Board games are a tremendous passion of mine. I've got about 700 around the house. Oh, my gosh. Actually, yes, kind of taking over the house. I'm selling off some because I, I literally can't fit them in the shelving anymore. If you want to put a link to your board game collection sales, you know, maybe we can help you out. There you go. we Will do. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm selling them off via auctions on BoardGameGeek.com, which if you were as geeky about board gaming as me, is a great resource. So, but I, I took my love of games, my love of technology, um, and, you know, I had been playing recently some games that really excited and inspired me. Games like Sid Meier's Pirates and Railroad Tycoon and the original SimCity. Mm-hmm. And that combined with my kind of lifelong love of strategy games made me say, okay, well, look, I, I really want to do this. I want to participate in this, this act of creation. And so that's what pulled me in. It's around 27 when I decided I want to get there. It took me a, a couple of years of building the right professional skills uh, to transition from nonprofits into technology and then into games and broke in in 94 and have been having a lot of fun with it ever since. Where did you break in? Uh, so my first job in gaming, I did a very short term engagement for an educational like courseware developer that was part of Simon and Schuster. Um, but my first real job in gaming actually was as a senior QA engineer at the learning company uh, down in Fremont. So the folks that made the original uh, Rita Rabbit and Clue Finders titles. And uh, I spent about six and a half years there. It seems like quite a few people got got started there. There were a lot of smart folks inside that company. They did some really, really interesting games, too. And I think it was kind of a good and really interesting place to launch in some ways, just because um, making games for kids means that you really need to learn to make something that's fun for somebody who isn't you. Mm, right. Right and understand an audience externally and realize that these guys inherently are going to hit usability issues that you never will, that they're going to hit a threshold of confusion that, you know, you just won't because you're in your 30s and you're making something for six-year-olds. And so as it happened, when I went to Pogo in 2000, a lot of the early casual game makers, especially concentrated there at Pogo, um, were folks who had been making kids software just because they had that experience of how to keep things simple, how to work for an audience that isn't you. Right. right? Um, I've definitely and, seen a lot of developers struggle with that. Yeah. And also kind of how to how to work lean. So when I started in the 90s, there were really no online games to speak of. Right. In the early 90s, you had some muds. That was about it. Um, so games were mostly delivered on a CD-ROM and, you know, they were super dependent on the video card you had in your PC. A lot of kids sort of tended to work on hand-me-down PCs. Not a lot of memory, not a lot of processor power, not very good graphics. So you kind of learn to, to work lean and to really focus your design and to kind of not hide behind rich assets. So it sounded sounds like some of these skills working working lean and being able to, you know, understand how to think like your user who might be different than you, these might have given you kind of a jump start when you started working in, in casual mobile games. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I think that those are really valuable skills for any designer, regardless of what you're doing. Um, I think, you know, generally in sort of down market platforms there's more value to kind of understanding the leanness and going asset light. Um, but really knowing like 
how to focus on gameplay, how to deliver that really strongly without relying on big flashy assets is your friend, regardless of whether you're making games for smartwatches or you're making games for next gen consoles. Mm. Yeah. Well, I want to get into that with you, but before we do, uh, you know, you you went on to work at Pogo and Popcap, Zynga and Playdom in a number of like very senior positions. Who were you learning from along the way? How, who were who were the people and what were the projects where you, you know, built up that the skill set that you have today? Yeah, well, I mean, after two decades in the industry, I sort of had a lot of teachers that have had profound impacts. Um at Pogo, I think it was interesting. There was um, there was definitely a management hierarchy, but there were three or four really strong designers, and you know n- none of whom are celebrities, right? But three or four really strong designers around the same points in their career that all came in at the same time. And I feel like just by working together, by uh, building a culture of critique, by you know collaborating and by challenging each other, um, we really, I, I learned a ton. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I slipstreamed off those guys or maybe they learned something too. Um, but, you know, those were uh, Troy Whitlock, who not only created a lot of great stuff at Pogo, uh, He's a very successful designer at uh, Disney, created uh, Star Wars Commander, uh, among other things. Okay. Uh, And Todd Kripleman, who actually now is working a bit on the other side of the fence. I think he's, last I heard, working at uh, Google, um, kind of working as an advocate for game developers, right? Trying to help them, uh, give them a voice inside the technical development of Android, kind of help them with their issues, you know. Todd and Troy were the guys who really brought prototyping to Pogo. Uh, before that, it had been much more of a waterfall shop. Uh-huh. Um, and so I learned a lot about prototype-driven development there. Um, at PopCap, I got you know exposed to um, Jason Kapalka, uh, who was you know one of the co-founders of PopCap and uh, really one of the great intuitive game designers. Um, I think um, he wasn't necessarily the best at like breaking down his process, but watching him work and learning from that was amazing. So I worked with him. Um, George Fan actually was one of my employees at PopCap, the creator of Plants vs. Zombies. Oh wow! So, yeah, actually, um, you know, you're you're talking to Crazy Dave, to to the original inspiration for the character. So. No way! You're the inspiration for Crazy Dave. I am the original Crazy Dave. It's eight years later, and there's still a zombie on my lawn. <laughs> Um, I was so just uh, looking at um, the new card card game. Yeah, I checked that out early in soft launch. I'm really eager to to see how it's come together in its final version. But yeah, there goes 14 minutes and 59 seconds of my 15 minutes of fame right there. <laughs> so George is a fabulous and intuitive designer. Supir Sidhu, who was the uh, the producer and designer on Peggle. Uh, was my boss while I was there, and watching him work was fantastic. One interesting thing in this this part of my career, which was really like the first 12 years, there wasn't a separation between producers and designers. So I didn't start working in the industry so early that it was the same guy doing the coding and the art and the design and the audio. So I came in later after coding and art and audio had really split off as distinct disciplines, you were generally the lead designer and the lead producer on your project, um, which actually, I think, taught me some very valuable stuff, both as a designer, really thinking about what's the difficulty of implementation, what's the overhead, what's the the cost of what I want to build, right? Mm -hmm. And how as a designer can I facilitate risk management and, you know, cost containment and really think about bang for the buck Because, you know, it's one thing to come up with ideas and another thing to be accountable for getting those actually done and into the game. I would Um, imagine it would also help with like what you mentioned earlier as far as understanding your demographic and and designing for them rather than for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And then I think also, though, it, it gave me much more of a connection to quality and the design process and the amount of iteration necessary as a producer than I would have had if I were coming up as a pure producer. So I, I feel like playing both of those roles has a lot of value. And even though I am um, a better designer than a Gantt chart completer, you know, I feel like building up, building up both of those. You just made a lot of producers very angry. 
<laughs> no, there's a, there's a lot more to the job than that, right? Please don't don't even get me there. I once referred to uh, the title of producer um, as a null signifier in a job interview, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I've known producers that were almost purely creatives, that were almost purely project managers, and even producers that were almost purely deal makers. It's a bit of a catch-all title. One of the things I tell people about being a producer is that other people are various tiles in the structure, and you have to be the grout. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's it's your job to you know kind of make it happen. Yeah, I, I have my whole building a house analogy. Is whenever I tell people I'm a game designer, the first thing they ask me is if I write a lot of code um, and the answer is like, no, relative to any capable coder, I'm a pretty crappy one. Although that's kind of one of my uh, skill sets that I'm hoping to rebuild and strengthen in the, in the coming year. Um, but you know, I kind of tell people, if you think about building a building, you know, the designer is the architect, the producer is the contractor, right? Is the, the mm. developer going to get it all there. And then, you know, hopefully they're super invested in the the quality of the final product. But, you know, I liken the engineers and the artists uh, to kind of the actual carpenters and electricians and folks who are going to come in and really put those things in place. Right. The craftspeople. The craftspeople. But the, the producers got to bring that team together and has to keep them flowing and organized and has to deal with all the unexpected stuff that comes up during that project. And then, of course, you know, they have to disappear for three weeks and stop answering phone calls. No, sorry, that's how they're different from contractors. <laughs> and, and then there's the associate producers who are more like craft services. Sure. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> so, no, but I mean, you know, for me, I actually really enjoy production. I really enjoy leading teams. I really enjoy kind of figuring out those puzzles of what we have to do next. And I actually really love working with prioritization and road mapping and planning. And I also really enjoy agile process management, right? So I think that's really fun. And, and I some interesting ways of doing that from some super cool people. But when it comes down to the meticulous tracking of every detail, I am there. There are other people who are much better at that. So just in terms of mentors, and I, I know I've gone long, but I'll, I'll sort of finish up um, quickly. But um, in terms of design, there was an incredibly brilliant staff of creative designers at Playdom. So Troy Whitlock was there again. Um, I also learned a ton from uh, Steve Moretzky. Oh, yeah. Um, so Steve and I are, are old friends. We've done a lot of public speaking together. We've organized symposia together. Um, so having a chance to work with him for a few years was great. Um, and brilliant, brilliant fellow named uh, Eric Todd, the Gardens of Time guy, was also there. And I learned a tremendous amount from him. Oh, and Raph Koster, who oh, yeah. I got to say, I, I read his book. one of the smartest guys in the business, for sure. Now, was that whole crew on that um, in that Soma office? No. So the HQ was actually in Palo Alto. Um, so let's see. Up in Soma, Steve worked out of Soma. Mm -hmm. Raph worked out of a studio that we acquired down in San Diego. And then Eric Troy and I worked out of the Palo Alto office, although um, we all did a fair amount of flying around. Playdom was a company that grew a lot by acquisition. So um, we had studios in North Carolina, Seattle, uh, Buenos Aires. So I got to fly to Buenos Aires a couple of times. That's that nice. No complaints. No complaints. Particularly Buenos Aires in January. Fabulous, right? Middle of the summer down there. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed kind of uh, flying around and, and partnering with those different teams and trying to help get them on track. So let's dig in a little bit on process, because you mentioned to me when we were talking ahead of the interview how, how this was a, something you really cared about and... I want to learn a little bit about the kinds of processes you feel are really important to mobile and free-to-play gaming and working with your clients. Sure. Well, I mean, let's let's talk about the processes that are critical to game development in general. So Sounds that's good. I hear a little clinking over there, so that's that's always a good sign. <laughs> it is. It is. It's um, you know a glass of seltzer water. So very, very exciting afternoon fair. <laughs> um, so one of the big things, and this actually gets missed a lot as folks become more engaged with the business models of their game, is, you know, your game has to be fun. If it's not fun, if it's not compelling, if it's not engaging, then there is nothing you can do in terms of monetization or metagame or what have you that's going to save it. Mm-hmm. Right. And for what it's worth, there are a lot of games that don't deserve to be saved. 
Um, so one of the things that I wind up doing that's a not lot not of, spoken like a ex not nonprofit person, Dave. <laughs> No, there are a lot of nonprofit projects that don't deserve to be saved. So, you know, ultimately using prototype driven development is a way of essentially finding out very quickly whether your your game is worth finishing. Right. Um, and so one of the things that I really push teams to do is to stack up an early kind of de-risking or pre-production process. Um a fair amount of my thinking on this is shaped by a, a paper by Mark Cerny. Um, so he's the guy that created um, Marble Madness and uh, I think it was Crash Bandicoot, many others, but uh, called the, the Cerny Method, right, which is really about sort of separating a project into a pre-production segment where process is very loose, the team works really, really fast, and really kind of gets to the point where they can build a scale model of a game that they think is going to be commercially successful. And then from there, you move into production, where the game is better understood, and you just kind of know what you're building, and you're focused on just building that out in a much more predictable, process-driven way. Right. Like in one stage, you're uh, you're figuring out how to make the dishes. What are the recipes for the dishes? And in the next stage, you're making the dishes. Yeah, theoretically. I mean, I think development isn't quite as rigid as that, and you need to allow for learnings that occur later in the process. Mm -hmm. Early on, at the very beginning of a project, there are a couple of things that I like to try to maneuver teams into doing. So one is using some really tightly defined rubrics to help them identify what they think the core fun of the game is going to be and who the audience is, right, and why it's going to align. To really take a little time to step back and think about what it is that they want to build and why. And then the second thing, uh, so that's, you know, kind of more of design and production collaboration. And that's kind of like uh, aligning the product with the audience, coming up with prototypical players, that sort of thing. So what I do try to do is I try to get a really simple kind of demographic profile. Um, who do you think you're building this for, you know, gender, age, favorite games, favorite TV shows? Can we build a little picture of what the content profile of the consumer we think is going to like this game is going to be? And then as we think about what we're putting into it, let's really think about how it aligns. But there are a couple of rubrics, like one of my favorites that I'm actually working on a blog post about at the moment is what I call the five fun factors. So this is kind of something I picked up at Pogo. Generally, the idea is your game should have somewhere between three and five absolutely great, super fun, highly repeatable things that your player can do, wants to do, and kind of knows how to get to so that they're willing to crawl through the mud to do these great things that are really exciting and compelling, right? Um, and, and how granular do you get when you're thinking about what a thing is? So I usually define it in terms of a player action. So let's say you're thinking about, you know, a civilization type game, right? Maybe it's, um, you know, unlocking a new unit or building, right? When I get to do that, it's really exciting because I know now I can win fights I couldn't win before. I can make my cities big in ways I couldn't before. So I want that moment of unlocking to feel really good. Gotcha. Right? And I'm willing to jump through a lot of hoops for that. Um, you know, in a Civ game, I probably want conquering an enemy city to feel great, right? I want discovering hidden features on the map to feel great. So these are like abstract, a little bit abstract, fun mechanics. Yeah, I mean, if you think about them from a sort of mechanics, dynamics, um, aesthetics. aesthetics, yeah, <laughs> they're kind of low end of the dynamics level, right? Um, but yeah, these are, you know, these are things where the player says, man, I want to do that again. That was great. Um, in my experience, if you're working on something at the scope of a mobile game and you're trying to get more than about five of those into your initial release, you tend to have a diffuse design, you tend to get feature creep, um, and those big moments that you're trying to punch actually don't don't sing. They don't get there. They don't get the hooks into players. Yep, that makes sense. You try to punch too much stuff and you have a lot of noise. Yep, and if you have fewer than three and you're trying to do something at the scope of a mobile game, you really need to be on the lookout for is there enough here to keep people engaged. And one of the things I find working with many designers, especially young designers, um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a, a board game nut. And, you know, board games are very mechanically driven. They're very mechanically naked. They they kind of sit out there and need to be uh, 
human moderated, a lot of young designers really like to start with very granular mechanics and build the game up from there. We're going to have this feature, Mm. right? That's interesting, yeah. And so I found that actually forcing the team or the designer to step back and say, well, okay, these are the things that we think are going to be awesome, and then challenging them as to whether the granular features they're talking about actually support the awesome, right? Do they do they help that happen? Are they kind of necessary scaffolding and infrastructure, or are they gone, right? That's kind of the three baskets I like to see for those uh, those granular feature designs. Either they make the payoffs great, or they're connective tissue that you need just to be able to get there, or focus your limited time and resources on doing something else. Um, so um, along with that kind of sort of vision crafting process, and there are a few other rubrics I use, but... Um, you know, that's a good one to start with. There's also a list of risks for the project, right? And that's something that, you know, is very producery. A producer's number one job is to manage risk. Uh, sure. That's that's my, my take on the producer's role. You're trying to understand what the risks for the project getting off course are and mitigate them as, as best you can, as early as you can um, to help keep things on track. So I like to see the producer having, really from the kickoff, a list of game-killing risks. And for games where you're innovating in gameplay, is this gameplay idea is usually a top risk, right? (laughs) Yeah. And in fact, even on games where you say, well, we're going to take this from column A and that from column B and put them together, often that interface is a bit of a stress point where you need to make sure that system A from game X and system B from game Y actually fit together in a meaningful way and the interface you want to put in between them going to be comprehensible and fun. Yeah, and and even that your version of element X or Y came out well. Yeah, um, so what I like to do, so I like to have that full list of stuff. So it may be about gameplay, it may be about technology, it may be about validating that an audience exists that you think is out there. Uh, It may be about developing a visual style for the game, looking around and saying, okay, what is, what are all the risks that can just, you know, take my, my game out of the air with a single bullet. Right. And then as a good producer, you want a mitigation plan for, for all of those. For gameplay issues, it's usually a prototype of some sort and you want that prototype to be as quick and as cheap as you can make it. If you can do a paper prototype that really answers your key questions, that's by far and away the best way to do it, right? The designer can secure some office supplies, go off in a corner, make up some cards, build the thing as a card game or a board game, play through it and figure out if it's going to work at that level. Take some pieces from one of your 700 board games. They belong together. I actually have a separate drawer of board game prototyping supplies. Okay. It's full of meeples and gems and hex grids and you name it. Bingo chips, Scrabble tiles, and that's actually super valuable. Every designer should have one of those crates. A lot of stuff, particularly stuff that really involves real-time interactions, needs a code prototype. When I am building a prototype in code, um, I really like to see a very small focused team there. You know, a designer and a programmer, maybe two, iterating really, really fast, right? The objective of a prototype is to fail fast, to make lots of mistakes, learn from them, move on, and keep moving until you either get to a game that is going to work, is going to be fun and playable and exciting, or conclude that you need to shelve the project. What uh, what would be fast? What's a fast iteration? Uh, so for me, I like to try to start with concepts that can be playable in less than two weeks. And then I like to make a significant change every one to two days. During right? like that two week sprint? No, I'm saying the initial two weeks, the project is permitted to go dark because just to get your core systems and mechanics functioning, it may take a week or two to get something actually happening on screen that resembles the part of the game that you're trying to address. Once that's done, I want a significant change daily, right? I want to try stuff out, give it a green, yellow, or red tag. Green being, this is awesome, it needs to stay in the game. Red being, that didn't work at all. Let's not go back there. Let's, you know, learn from it, but it's a dead end. And yellow being, let's take this idea and revise it in the next iteration. But once you have something playable in prototype form, I really like to sort of have the engineers hand off something in the afternoon, have the designers play it in the afternoon and evening, and come back in the morning saying, okay, here's what we're going to try out next. Okay. Yeah. For a 12-month project, I'm 
kind of willing to let this process go on for up to three months after you get that first playable. So my rule of thumb is within a month of having something moving on screen that you know represents the basic idea of your game, there needs to be some kind of spark in the prototype. People should be playing it and saying, I think there's something there or this seems interesting. And, yep. Yep. and by the time you get to 90 days, the fun should be clear and well elaborated. People should be saying, this is good. Where are the other levels? How do I play more, right? You should have people hooked on your prototype. Now, inside the prototype, I'm a huge protagonist of using few, if any, assets. I use a lot of squares, circles, triangles, a lot of text labels to make things clear what they are. Um, I don't want to put anything pretty in my prototype because once you start putting beautiful art into something, people, people fall get confused. in love with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, either they overestimate the the fun factor, if the game is fun, overestimate how close it is to shipping. When I have an engineer that I'm prototyping with, I ask them to write code that they would be ashamed to show their colleagues in a review, right? The code should be literally embarrassing. It should be as slapdash as humanly possible, so it can be done fast and we can move on to the next iteration, right? And I'd rather take a month of that and then have the developer throw up their hands and say, oh my God, dude, this thing is such a mess. You've asked us to do all this crappy code. I need three days to refactor it and let them go dark for three days. I'd much rather have that than have them try and architect and scaffold and make stuff pretty. Right, or or decide three months later that now they need to refactor because they're well, using the same code that they started with. Yeah, yeah, and the code for the prototype should always be dumped. Always, 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 always. It can be hard to get political cover for that in a lot of studios. So one trick that I've learned over the years, you prototype in something different than your development platform. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, like, so like Game Maker or something like that? Game Maker, Defold, Game Salad. Um, there's a bunch of tools out there. So, you know, if you're going to make a Unity game, prototype it in Flash. <laughs> Anything but Unity. Right? Anything but Unity. That's a great, yeah. great trick. Yeah, and then when management says, well, but we've got all this code here, you say, oh, sorry, can't, right? Um, I am a big believer in time boxing during prototyping, right? So if after a month it's not feeling like there's a spark, right? If instead of this looks interesting or there's something there, people are looking at it and going like, I don't get it. Or, you know, I think I hear my mommy calling, right? Sorry, I have to go home. I can't play baseball anymore. My mommy's calling me you don't want to give that project a whole lot more time, right? So in that situation, you might give the team like up to a week to get something that has a little bit of grab. And then if they don't, okay, move on. Likewise, if you hit that three-month milestone and it's not fun yet, it's not grabbing people, maybe another three weeks at the most. And then if not, you put it aside, right? Sometimes just like writing an article, you need to write your rough draft, put it in your desk drawer for a couple of days and come back to it. Sometimes stepping away from a prototype is the best thing you can do. So mapping that back on to kind of the Cerny method that you were talking about earlier, would that three-month window be kind of like the end of the pre-production phase? Yeah, I like to, while the prototype is in development, at the same time have some concept art going. If you need technology prototypes, because you have technical risk, I like to have those going. But at the end of that three months, I really hope you can take a step back from the project and say, okay, we built something to address all of the game killing risks. We, we now believe that the game can be successful. Uh, we've seen that it's fun. We've solved our tech problems. We've got some art direction that we think is going to work for the target population. Um, now it's time to kind of shift gears a little bit. So I actually have a kind of brief planning stage that comes after that. It says, okay, well, given everything we've learned during prototyping, now what do we think the product will take to build? And then a much more linear building stage where you are working in the target code base, you are integrating assets, kind of elaborating through a lot of the less risky design or buttoning up details. One mistake that people make, and Dan Cook, uh, who I think is just a, a brilliant game design thinker. Yeah has a great article about this on Lost Garden that completely shut down the creative process after you get through that prototyping pre-production stage um, and say, okay, well, now we're going to build this out exactly and we cannot deviate at all. You, um, you wind up missing out on a lot of good creative opportunities. Of course. So 
you want to make sure that you've got some wiggle room left to kind of learn more about the game, learn more about the players, um, discover and improve as you go. But yeah, it's kind of pre-production is let's de-risk all the, the crazy risks, planning, let's figure out what it's going to take to get built, and building, let's build it. And then, of course, you know, this is very much a packaged goods model, right? So the building kind of never ends as you go into sort of endless cycles of live development and free-to-play, um, and as you get more and more user data to sort of come into the process. What do you do if opinions differ about whether there's a spark? So in general, kind of building a, a competitive mobile game at this point in history is going to cost you multiple millions. Yeah, right? I think a lot of people have still not come to terms with that. But yes. Yeah, I've been doing some scratch budgets for a, a potential project. And even the cheap ones at this point tend to be around a million and a half to two million. We're talking about free to play kind of games as service style mobile games. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is kind of what your development costs you up to the point where you're ready to soft launch it. Um, and then if the game looks like it's going to be competitive as you bring it to market through soft launch, you're going to need to continue to support that team. And you're going to need to acquire users on some steady basis so that you can bring them into the game to, to sort of uh, verify that players are behaving the way you think, um, that the technology stands up and so on. And then if the numbers look good coming out of soft launch, you're likely to want a large launch marketing budget on top of that. And that can be multiple millions again. So just ask yourself, like, before you would come out of pocket for the, whatever, three to five to ten million bucks it's going to cost to launch a top-of-market mobile game, how strong would you want your proof and conviction to be? Right. Right. It's a big investment. This is not, you know, let's let's take 200,000 development funds and throw it together and, and see what happens. Right. But and but that somehow there still ends up being quite a bit of uh, gilding the lily. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Meaning taking something that doesn't have that heart of gold and dressing it up, thinking that's going to change change the outcome. You mean polishing the turd. Yes. Gilding the lily is actually a, a term I've heard in game development to mean something at the opposite end, which is kind of um, taking a game that's really solid and continuing to work on it well past the point that it's actually done. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so taking something that's basically done and continuing to work on it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, gilding the lily has its own problems, mostly that you can lose some market incumbency and you have some additional burn while you fool around with stuff. There's a minor risk of, of breaking stuff. Polishing the turd is a much bigger problem, right? And um, so, yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about polishing the turd. Yeah, I have I have polished some turds in in my career and it it never ends well. Right. Um, at the end of the day, a game that isn't fun for some meaningful target segment, isn't engaging, isn't retentive, isn't something people want to do, is not going to be a financial success, right? If nobody's having fun with your game, you're not going to keep people around. They're not going to give you money. Um, I'm a big believer in you know, kind of brutal honesty about where a game is and what its prospects are. Um, but I do think that there are a lot of games that should not go into production that do, usually for a few reasons. Um, so kind of typical causes that I've seen are there are external contractual obligations. So sometimes you may have, say, a license signed, and there's a big breakup fee if you don't deliver the product. Delivering sure. the product may make sense, or even just you know not delivering a product is a PR nightmare. Um, I think the, um, you know, there are a lot of reasons that show up kind of around other types of external commitments, especially in public companies. If you've gone out and sort of told the investment community, we're going to make a lot of money in Q3 because of this release, um, it is hard not to release that thing in Q3. Um, but if it's not ready, then not releasing it is usually the right decision. Um, and there's also a lot of ego investment, right? Um, people are hopefully passionate about the games that they work on, right? I know that I work really, really hard to make the games fun and enjoyable and grabby. Um, and when you invest a lot of yourself into your work that way, especially into creative work, um, it can be really, really hard to get enough perspective on it to be able to objectively say, this is working or this is not working. Um, and frankly, even if you kind of know it's not working, 
it can be hard to admit that externally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it so, gets even harder not to admit it over time, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. So there's this sort of sunk cost problem where the more you work on it, the more invested you become. So the more hesitant you are to kind of judge that work in a, a really critical way. Right. Um, so I think, you know, this is actually something that I find myself doing with uh, a lot of teams um, is what I call the emperor's new clothes guy. Right. So presumably you're familiar with the tale of the emperor's new clothes. I have my own use of that term in, in game development that, that I'll tell you about after. <laughs> Interesting. OK, so. You know, uh, for any listeners who may not be familiar, the Emperor's New Clothes is a, a folk tale about a very vain emperor who, you know, kind of loves to be well dressed. And, uh, you know, a uh, tailor uh, comes to him, and the tailor is kind of a charlatan, and he tells him he's going to sew him a fantastic set of, of clothes that are going to be gorgeous and the envy of everyone at the royal parade. Um, and the king gives him a fabulous sum of money. And um, the tailor actually just pockets the money and, and makes nothing, um, goes into the naked king, tells him that he's dressing him and that, you know, um, he looks fabulous and that the clothes are invisible to him, but to everyone else, they're going to look amazing. Um, and of course, all of the king's uh, court and his supporters and his toadies tell him that he looks amazing. He walks down the, the street in the Royal Parade. Everyone's, you know, applauding. And like some little boy comes forward and says, he's naked. Right. And all the adults around him go, no, 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 no. He looks great. The clothes are fantastic. Right. Because they know the king is very vain and they're going to be oh, he's like, no, dude, he's naked. I can <laughs> see all of you. Right. This often actually becomes my my function on a team. Right. Is to be the guy who really comes in to sort of take a hard look at what they're building and make sure that they have a realistic handle on what its problems are, what its challenges are, and what they're going to need to do to it to, to actually make it successful. Um, Wuga, whom I did a lot of consulting for over the last couple of years, um, recently released a game called Warlord. And this is a game I sort of coincidentally touched while I was uh, driving development on another prototype there, or driving design. Um, the product lead asked me to play it. And, you know, I played it for a few minutes, and I told him it was quite terrible, and he and the game had been in development for, I think, a couple of years at that point, um, that it was it was really dreadful and I, I didn't want to keep playing it. And that, you know, he actually really needed to get out of production mode, get back into prototyping and make the game fun or kill it before he really continued developing it. You know, they actually, to their credit, went back and built like a gameplay prototyping team and did a bunch of paper prototyping, built a bunch of, of board board games, um, played them out internally and actually got the core mechanic to a place where it was pretty damn fun. Part of that process, they brought me in every few months to kind of help evaluate process, but I wasn't a super hands-on guy with that. But now it's, you know, a couple of years later, and I just heard from producer of that project, uh, which, by the way, uh, recently released uh, worldwide for iOS and Android, and it's pretty fun. Check it out. And he just sent me a note of thanks for saying that my kind of intervention in making the team realize that what they were building wasn't fun and needed serious work on the core game and the core engagement was one of the most valuable things that anyone had ever done for the project. Yeah, that's great. You were the little kid. I was I was the emperor's new clothes guy. Like that game is naked. I can see stuff I shouldn't see on that game. That's not good. Well, I th I think yeah, having an experienced hand like you give an outside perspective on on a product and development can be just incredibly valuable. It helps. It's one of the the services that I provide for teams is just kind of looking at a snapshot of where the game is, regardless of where it is in the development cycle. So I've done this with live games. I've done this with prototypes. I've done this with games in production. Yep. Um, you know, and often that's the beginning of a longer relationship where I work with the team more regularly throughout their development cycle, work with them to kind of mature their development processes, teach some of these uh, tools and rubrics to the team and, and help them apply it internally. Um, ultimately, what I'm trying to do is over time, just sort of get the team operating at as high a level as possible so that they can then, you know, just sort of um, unceremoniously boot me out and force me to look around for new customers. Uh, because, you know, they, they've kind of downloaded all that wisdom. Um, but it's amazing how many times it just starts with like me going, yeah, game is naked, guys. Sorry. I've had to do that, too. And, and I've also you're I mean, you're somebody who I've gone to when I'm looking for some wisdom on on a project. 
well, you know, I'm kind of an omnivorous guy. I try to make a study of what's working in the marketplace, what's the, you know, kind of the prior art out there. And so I just wound up over time with, you know, 700 board games in my house. And I think I had led production or design on like 50 plus video games. And I've now consulted on dozens and dozens of others. I just kind of got this massive library of things that work and things that have been done and how they work. And I'm, I'm often able to kind of slot those in. Um, but, you know, I, I have a, a friend uh, who works in the kind of investment consulting space. Uh, games are one of two or three sectors he covers, does a lot of due diligence for investors and helping companies that are trying to raise money. Um, and what he says is that he's got now um, three decades of um, painful mistakes, you know, in his bag of experience and high skill at pattern matching. <laughs> yeah. So by, by the way, just as an aside, the my use of the emperor's clothes analogy is for um, working as a as a producer. Um, when I was working as a producer doing external development, you get into this situation where like the executives uh, at the publishing company and at a development studio will agree to ridiculous schedules and budgets, and they'll do it because um, it benefits it benefits the studio just to have the relationship and the deal, even if they know it's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. on that schedule and budget and of course the um the publishing execs are are often looking for you know for better or for worse they're looking for the best what they think is the best deal that they can get and mm -hmm. so it leaves the producer in the position of the kid saying this is not realistic and everyone's just winking at each other yes yeah yeah absolutely no i've 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 been in those situations as well, and unwinding them is always painful. That's what leads to the come to Jesus meeting. Right. But, you know, sometimes maybe that's all part of it. Sometimes what's all part of it? Like a project may just need to get started on with a wink and have a come to Jesus moment. Oh, yeah. You know, the more games I make, the less I am fond of starting games with what I know are unrealistic premises. I, I, I personally really don't enjoy it. Yeah, no, it's it's not fun. And in fact, one of the things that I got to to be in the habit of doing as a, a producer when I was doing some external stuff was inserting some cushion between my budget and my contract. Because mm -hmm. in my experience, a really well managed and really well thought out game goes over budget by about twenty percent, averagely by about fifty percent, and poorly by a hundred percent or more. I ran those things pretty tight, so I just tried to give myself 20 or 25% buffer. Right, right. But it, it gets complicated, right? Because then a lot of people add buffer, so then this average of 20%, for example, does that include does that include the buffer? Does that, you know, and and it's happening up and down the chain, right? So if you ask an engineer for an estimate, are they including buffer? Uh, it's, it's a funny, it's a very funny thing uh, to, and a very personal thing to know how to schedule specific groups of people. Yeah, one of my favorite little bits of um, extreme programming, which was right after kind of the Agile Manifesto was written in the next two years, a bunch of different, really, really like tightly defined and honestly kind of rigid agile methodologies arose. Uh, and one of them was called extreme programming. And they had some tenets that I didn't particularly care for. Um, for instance, every line of code should be pair programmed. Right. I remember this. I think the programmers were supposed to like sit next to each other in some specific way. Yeah. Basically, at any given time, one programmer should be programming and explaining what he or she is programming to the other programmer sitting over their shoulder listening and offering feedback. For what it's worth, for super tricky bits of code that are hard to get right, this is still valuable. But for every line of code in a project, it's just overkill. But they did have a nice tool that was sort of part of that agile methodology that was about person-by-person -person velocity measurement. The idea being for each person on the project, you record what their task estimates are and what their actual task times are. Mm -hmm. Not to be you know, punitive or, you know, create trouble or show this up in a performance review, but more to the point where you look and say, warning, truth ahead, Dave is a terrible <laughs> estimator. Things always take, on average, 30% longer than he thinks they will. Then in the future, whenever Dave turns in an estimate, you mentally mark it up by 30%. Yeah. Whereas you say, you know, Jordan's a sandbagger, man. He always gets it done in half the time he tells us. Then in your own internal accounting, you cut Jordan's estimates in half. 
because <laughs> I know you're like that, man. I don't know if that's a compliment, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a really useful measure and really understanding the proclivities of your team is important. And what I will say is even if that padding does go all the way up the chain, the padding goes up the chain because it tends to get consumed because games are really hard. They're less predictable than, you know, kind of non-game app development. They have colossal non-functional requirements that you have to account for, which is to say they have to be fun, right? They have to monetize. Uh, so, you know, getting all that stuff right is hard. And in a red ocean like free-to-play mobile games, you really have to get it right. You really have to get it all right. That is a red ocean. That, that ocean is so bloody right now. Yeah, uh, I definitely feel it some mornings. Well, um, you know, I, I know through my experience working with you, and it's clear from our, our chat today that you, you're a great person to bring, bring wisdom and processes to, to, to the development of these sorts of games. I'm, I'm curious, as we kind of close out here, where mm-hmm. do you think the new opportunities are? Where is the blue ocean in the industry uh, in, in your mind? Well, um, it's an interesting question. So... I will say, if you're looking for uh, for the gold rush, by all means, make some VR titles. Right. Right. Because the funding environment over there right now is kind of stupid. There's a lot of investors just spreading a lot of bets on the table. Uh, there's a lot of platform providers who are willing to take a bath in order to get um, software made for their hardware, right? Because ultimately, software sells hardware. Um, so... If you are looking to fund a company that can implode in two to three years, I would totally do VR. Um, so things that I think are a little more interesting and durable. Um, just let me let me put a little caveat on this, which is, you know, I've done a lot in my career by being able to see what the next kind of down market platform was going to be. Um, so right, I spent, right, right. I spent years building kids games and then games in browsers and then game on Facebook and then uh, now games on mobile. Um, the crystal ball on the next thing right now is cloudier than it's been in a while. Um, we've kind of been on mobile as the next platform. I have a couple of ideas about things that may be next. Um, on the, you know, kind of sideways side of the market, not the kind of down market thing you have for other reasons, um, I actually find AR pretty interesting. Yep. So just the idea that you don't have to be fully immersed, you don't have to unplug, you can be in the world and gaming and enjoying, I think, is a really compelling idea. You'll certainly um, look a lot less foolish doing AR. Maybe. At least at home. Maybe. Tell it to Google Glasses. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, there there will be potential to do interesting AR stuff that doesn't make you look like you're doing a scene from Tommy. Right. Um, have you seen the Snapchat glasses? No, I have not actually. They launched like uh, I mean I haven't seen them in person, but they just launched a um, a pair of gla- like a sort of Google glasses kind of thing to record uh, snaps. Oh man, you're gonna make me do a web search while I'm talking to you on this interview. <laughs> Check um, it out. They're trying to make it cool. You know, they're, they're actually trying to make that cool. So um, for what it's worth, I do also think um, VR games may arrive at some point, but it's a number of years out. Sure. And it's not going to be until non-game VR applications have pushed very, very deep. Oh, that's interesting. Population. So, yeah, dude, like, let's go to Paris, right? Or let's let's go home shopping. Let's go home shopping. Let's redecorate, right? Like, I'm going to put on my glasses and start moving furniture around the living room. Um, But I think ultimately AR is probably the better play in most of those spaces, right? Or many of them. But do you think that's pretty far off, too? Because it seems like that's a, a pretty a, a pretty big lift technologically, too. Yeah, I do. But I think over the long term for gaming, it feels like it's got a little more potential. Mm-hmm. The trend that I see in gaming is actually towards like less immersion, shorter sessions. Um, and VR is just all about plugging in and tuning out. Right. I'm really interested in how the the sort of game market for wearables evolves, right? Because this is another place where you think about, you know, your Apple Watch. You have it for other reasons, right? It's there to give you notifications on SMS. But if you can enjoy a little bit of light gameplay with it as you go, I think that's super interesting. Personally, I'm really fascinated by what kind of games you can do that are really, really concentrated in audio. Hmm. 
right? Um, so one of the things that I'm noodling on right now is I'll just tell all your listeners so someone can beat me to the punch, but uh, working on some designs for what would a game that you play entirely using audio um, via the Bluetooth stereo of your car look like. I know that uh, Dave Grossman is doing some work in that space. I know a little bit about what Dave's doing, and the creative direction I want to take for it is quite different from the really narrative-focused stuff that he's doing. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm very curious. I don't know how much you can talk about that. Mm, probably about as much as I did. Okay. Well, when you're ready, we're going to have you back. Yeah, we can talk about that a little more offline. And then uh, hopefully when I have, you know, maybe a team and a little bit of uh, money to, to explore that idea, I think it'll be a great time for a follow up conversation. Sounds good, Dave. It was great having you on the show. I love hearing your your thoughts and your your wisdom. Always appreciated. Thanks for coming on. Jordan, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I look forward to working with you in the future. If you enjoyed this episode and my interview with Dave, please consider supporting the show. It's very easy to do. It's free. All I ask is that you head over to iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play or wherever your podcasts are not sold and you subscribe and write us a review, write me a review and tell me what you like about the show. Tell me what you'd like on the future to see on the show because the show is here for you. You can also reach out to me directly if you have any questions uh, about any of the topics we've had on the show, jordan at brightblack.co. You can also find links on the blog. That's playmakerspodcast.com. And if you head there, we've got a blog post with all the links to everything that we talked about on the show. So there are a lot of designers mentioned, for example, we'll have all that on the show, the games, the companies, and anything else relevant from the interview with Dave. So go ahead and check out one of those things. Perhaps head to playmakerspodcast.com where you can kind of do everything. You can learn about the guest. You can get the links to the things we talked about. And you can also subscribe and find us on all the big platforms. So that's playmakerspodcast.com. And with that, I will sign out and see you next week. Thanks for listening to Playmakers. Playmakers.